Good afternoon, and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital platform featuring a variety of programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to another edition of our Service Solutions Series today, being presented by Paul Food and Beverage. If you're just joining us, please stay on the lookout for housekeeping instructions to be relayed via the chat window so we're not taking up any more valuable time with routine info. But do note if you have any questions throughout uh, for our team on how to participate in this virtual event, please message myself, Brian Gilbert, or Brooke Gilbert at any time via a private message inside the Zoom webinar platform. Now, let's get this party started. In this edition of our Service Solutions Series, we're joined by the team at Paul Food and Beverage for an in-depth look at the key market trends defining the cannabis oil market, the assorted challenges in the cannabis oil extraction process, and the weaknesses which exist in current commonly used filtration methods. While doing so, they'll outline how to optimize your extraction process and ensure product quality with clarification and color removal solutions. I'd like to welcome Connor Hutchison with Paul Corporation and Klaus Hesselnick with, from Helderpad to the virtual stage. How are you all doing this afternoon? Hey, good morning, Brian. Doing well. Happy to be here. Yeah, good morning. Thanks, Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Connor and Klaus, for both joining us today. Before we kick things off, why don't we tell the audience a little bit more about your background and expertise? So starting with Connor, Connor Hutchison is a field application specialist at Paul Corporation and a member of their scientific and laboratory services organization and has been working with cannabis producers for over three years. Leveraging a chemistry degree and a deep process knowledge of commercial food and beverage manufacturing, he has played an integral part in Paul's entrance into the global cannabis market. As an SLS associate, he consults with customers on how to best integrate Paul's solutions into a specific process. Moreover, Connor has a passion for teaching customers how to assess and optimize current processes, focusing on minimizing operational expense and maximizing total filter life. Welcome, Connor. And next up, we have Klaus Hesselnick. Klaus Hesselnick is a partner of sales and strategic development with Helderpad, a collection of hemp processing specialists committed to continuous research, development, and diffusion of hemp processing technology. Growing up in Holland and as a longtime resident of the U.S., Klaus has always been aware of the different ways that the cultures have treated cannabis. The rise in acceptance of medical cannabis in the early 2000s identified a considerable, considerable gap to him. Cannabis became medically recommended by physicians, but their ability to properly prescribe effective doses assumed that they had the information they needed. They didn't. They were not able to predict the proper dosage or effect of what they were prescribing. And in 2010, after a conversation with a physician, Klaus set out to close that gap. It was a solution born in his homeland, and the proprietary analysis procedure they use today allows Helderpad to determine with remarkable accuracy both the effect of different strains and their potency. This has enabled Helderpad to develop consistent, reliable, and safe products for the first time. Well, we're very excited to have you both joining us this afternoon to present today's session entitled Service Solutions, a budding industry, how filtration solutions can help with cannabis extracting, being presented by Paul Food and Beverage. We'll turn it over to you to kick things off, Chris. Uh, please activate your screen share and take it away from here. That I can do. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, one minute here. Let's see, good old technology. Beautiful, here we are once again. Hi everyone, Connor Hutcherson, happy to be here. Uh, a little bit more about my background. I studied chemistry at CSU Chico, focused on inorganic solid state materials. I joined Paul in 2017 as a field application scientist. I've been in this role for about three years. Uh, once again, I'm a member of our SLS Global Technical Support Group. The best way of explaining this is it's really where customer support meets process consulting, and that'll make a bit more sense as we continue through these slides. So I'd like to hand it off now to my friend, Klaus. Hi, yes, uh, nice introduction there earlier. It was a little bit um, more information than I was uh, 
going to share. That's a bit of history of where I came from. But, you know, held a pet in principle. We support processors um, with extraction and distillation uh, technologies and anything in between there. Um, and happy to help out in any way we can to make sure you have proper product. Beautiful. Thanks, Klaus. So here's a question that I want everyone to think about throughout this presentation. A filter is a filter, right? So often when I'm speaking with customers, there's this assumption that the filters that we're using for this industry are really no different than the common coffee filters you may be using every morning if you're a coffee drinker. So the aim, one of the aims of this presentation is to try to explain why and how that logic of thinking as it pertains to filtration really isn't correct. A bit about Paul Corporation. It's a rather old company founded in 1946. We were acquired several years ago by Danaher, a life science conglomerate. Uh, there's over 10,000 employees, but more importantly than the number of employees, it's the, the number of employees that have worked directly in the industries that we're servicing, allowing us to have a deep process knowledge to properly understand and solve the problems that you may be facing. You can see here, there are a variety of companies that fall under the Danaher umbrella. We're over here in the life science uh, section. You can see here, Paul, I do wanna mention a couple things. We do have sister companies, uh, specifically Cyx and Phenomenex who are operating within this industry. Cyx on the analytical side, working with HPLCs for analytical testing. Moreover, for the analytical testing, Phenomenex actually developing some really great resins that can be used for analytical testing. So being able to pull that deep process knowledge, not just from the manufacturing side that we're focused on here in Paul. You can see here, uh, when you think of filters, once again, you may be thinking of a common coffee filter, but there are several different types of filters. Uh, to summarize it, if it can be filtered, we likely have a filter for it. Uh, depending on the different process is the different type of filter that we've that we'll decide to utilize. Uh, an example would be uh, the most common filters we're using for this industry are our depth media, our sheets specifically. So these sheets um, being cellulose where we immobilize different filter additives to really beautifully polish, remove waxes, things of that nature uh, from your fluid stream. Also uh, focusing more so on the CO2 side, things that have a really heavy solid load that would pretty quickly blind these filters, being able to use something like our cartridges, which are shown here uh, in the top left. So these cartridges doing a really great job of removing waxes in these bigger, bulkier, amorphous type solids. Uh, one other thing that I do wanna highlight on this slide is in the top center, this is our gene decycler or a uh, rapid PCR, PCR being polymerase chain reaction. Uh, system, which is capable of rapidly identifying things like E. coli, salmonella, listeria, yeast, and bacteria, uh, alleviating some of the burden that you may be having uh, for your testing. Once again, going back to the, the statement that I made about having a deep process knowledge. So focusing on the entire process, not just filtration. And what I mean by that is from biomass to finished consumer packaged good, being able to coach and guide our customers as to best practices and how filtration can alleviate many of the bottlenecks and pain points that you may be observing. It's been really fun for me getting to work uh, with customers like Klaus, building a relationship, getting to learn specific problems that this industry is seeing and strategically placing filters that solve this problem. I'm going to hand this over to Klaus now, who's going to talk a little bit more about the cannabis extraction process flow. Yeah, I think um, most people, or maybe, um, are familiar with with what's going on here. Um, but let's walk through it. Right, we get plant material in. It's going to be uh, extracted. This can be done with um, BHO, CO2, or uh, our current favorite is cold alcohol extraction. Um, and after that extraction and removal of the, the solvent, we end up with uh, a crude oil. That crude oil most likely will include some form of chlorophyll, but can also do waxes and other uh, parts. So then we move through a filter, uh, clean it up, um, and continue to um, re refine it. 
Um, after that, there's uh, potential to uh, go further and um, get a distillate. Um, once you have this distillate, um, you can further um, secure it by doing some micro uh, stabilization, and uh, this causes that um, you know uh, further degradation uh, doesn't happen. And um, then you end up with a product that now can be used in your edibles or in vape pens or um, places like that. Awesome. Thank you for that, Klaus. So what we're going to talk about now is just briefly on the weaknesses and current filtration methods. So, Klaus, if you wouldn't mind, just I know you've been in this industry uh, for over a decade, just talking about how you started, how you've gotten to where you're at now different challenges and scaling. It's a rather large operation that you have now, how you got to do that efficiently. Uh, I think that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we uh, started in 2012 uh, with uh, CO2 extraction um, and also did a little bit of BHO on the side. Um, and we started f uh, filtering at that point right away. I mean, when you uh, do CO2, you get a lot of waxes. Uh, and so those need to be filtered. Um, we started off with, you know, just a Buchner, uh, Buchner funnel and, uh, and the filters there, which are much like coffee filters. Uh, and then from there, as we grew and um, started doing larger and larger production runs, we need to be more consistent. Um, and we needed to also uh, be able to replicate that uh, on a regular basis, of course. So um, we started to look around and um, got in contact with Paul. At that time, we uh, switched over completely to uh, cold alcohol extraction and we did small batches of about uh, five to 10 pounds uh, at a time. Um, and so, you know, we, we got set up with a nice little uh, filter that was a uh, closed loop. Um, and then as we grew and currently we can do about 100 pounds uh, an hour and we have another machine in the works that will do uh, 1,000 pounds an hour. And um, we just keep all in the loop about these things because they have ways for us to scale this up and... Um, and move along, even though you know ultimately the the the, um, the protocol doesn't change anything, but your size does change. And so um, having somebody like Paul uh, that is in support of you um, is is really beneficial. Um, if I look around on this uh, on the screen, uh, you know you just can see. Um, the things that you need <laughs> you know it's uh, contamination for open air that's that's a big problem if you have a thousand uh, gallons of alcohol uh, running through your system um, having it not in line and having to make special batches will make it so that you have uh, larger and larger containers all sitting around um, now things might become inconsistent um, so starting to work early on um, at, at your processes uh, and, and seeing where you want to go with it and then call the right people to, to support you is, uh, is really beneficial. I, I can't say enough of that. It's just, you know, it makes life so much easier. Yeah, thank you, Klaus. I appreciate that. It was, it was really great when we first started working with Helderpad in Klaus. We went in, we essentially threw every, all those filters that you saw in an earlier slide, threw everything at it really trying to see what would work best for uh, the outlined goal. Uh, and it was a, a really interesting process. Over the last couple of years, we've been constantly innovating that. Uh, we've been working closely with Klaus and Helderpad to really figure out and tease, you know, what types of filters are working best. If there's kind of a one-off skew that you may have, is there something that we can do specifically for that? So it's been really interesting getting, getting to learn and actually uh, spend time with an industry expert and getting coached as to what problems need to be solved. Right. And then that, that kind of service is available was also a huge eye opener. I mean, the fact that you guys uh, were like, Oh, well, let's just, you know, stop by for a couple of days and uh, let's look at your products and, and go from there. And uh, that was just like, okay, yeah, <laughs> that is, that makes life so much easier. 
Absolutely. And one say one thing I can say is that every different fluid stream is different. You know, obviously, you guys know if you're working with a CBD dominant strain, you're going to have so much more wax. And if you're working with a THC dominant strain, there's not as much wax, but it has its own pain points. So really being able to, to work with the customers, you know, given COVID times, just hop on the phone if that's the only thing that's available at the time and just talk through the process and really start to understand how we can best fit in. So, mm. okay. I think my screen's lagging a little bit. doesn't look like it wants to uh, go to the next slide. Apologize for this guys. One second, brief technical er error. Okay, let's try sharing this again. Oh, COVID. Always something with all of these new. What, you blaming this on COVID too? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, uh, you know, obviously there's several challenges in the, the cannabis oil extraction process. There's really, there's a different nature of things that we're trying to filter out, obviously. So uh, if you were to break these into two different categories, we have the hard particulate, things like the carbohydrates, the fats, the waxes, the things that can really be a pain. Uh, and then we also have the, the color adding molecules, things like chlorophyll, uh, pigments, carotenoids. So being able to have technology that can solve both problems simultaneously in line. Klaus, if you want to speak a little bit uh, about the color removal process and, and some of the, the value that it's added, not just from the, the, the filtration aspect, but ultimately how it's impacted distillation yeah. and solvent recovery. Um, yeah, especially with uh, with alcohol extraction and cold alcohol extraction, uh, we at, at one point found that um, after extraction and um, removal of the of the solvent, we ended up with uh, a crude that was that would in our uh, distillation equipment it would just um, fill the pumps up, uh, the waxes, the the chlorophyll they. Uh, they started to harden and they would just uh, fill the fill the pumps and, and just, you know, we would have to replace pumps and uh, it was just also massive, massive hassle. So again, um, I called Paul and, and we kind of talked it over. They um, recommended a super pack at the time and we started using those and it actually has um, made that part so much easier Um where we're not replacing pumps, they don't get clogged as much anymore. Um, and it really, um, you know, at, at, we were going back and forth like, hell, do we need to go back to just CO2 extraction because of the ease it uh, provides later on in distillation? Um, however, of course, with alcohol extraction, we can do so much larger badges. Um, and, um, and so we're going with that. Um, and then, um, and then just use you know, proper filtration. And that really did the trick for us. And that makes everything go smooth. Absolutely. I, I was blown away the first time I saw, I remember you had a, a, a beaker that was full of it and it just looked like a, uh, like a, a plastic mallet. It was, it was so impressive how, how nasty this stuff was that was gunking up the pumps right. for any of you that haven't seen it. It's like, if you were, to be making a syrup, just put it in a hot pan and let it sit there, you know, on the highest heat for, you know, 10 minutes, what would, what it would turn into this carbony, nasty material. So I imagine whoever has to clean that at the facility, uh, it's a bit of a, a pain point. Absolutely. No. And we got another poll coming in. Another poll question. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. I apologize, guys. It seems like it's sticking on the slides when I try to change in between them. So just one minute, please. Thanks for bearing with me. Yeah. We yeah, it looks like it's pretty and stuck. And lenticular filters. I can start a screen share on my end, Connor. If, if yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. Thanks, no Brian. Yeah. I appreciate that. Me flows out of my slack real fast and then what um slide were we on just so that i can read? i believe we were on slide nine i i could be mistaken okay not a problem let me get this activated and we'll get this going real quick thank you yeah not a problem thanks for sticking with us guys i appreciate that 
So we can go to the next slide, please. Beautiful. So we've talked a bit about the two different categories where it comes to clarification and color removal. So focusing here on the clarification aspect, uh, Klaus has mentioned this a couple times throughout this presentation, but it is in an enclosed, closed loop system, uh, sanitary as well. Uh, one thing that I think is really neat is there may be uh, several people on listening to the webinar that are using plate and frames. And I'm sure you know that it takes up quite a lot of space in your manufacturing facility. One thing that Paul has been working on innovating over the last few decades is how can we minimize our footprint, but still bring the value of enough surface area to tackle small or large batches. So if you were to look at the image, uh, the, the top left, you can see that we actually have the ability to vertically stack these filters. So you can double, triple, quadruple the surface area at your availability without taking away valuable space on your manufacturing floor. Uh, we've talked a bit about different types of optimization that you can choose to undergo. The way that this is accomplished is, once again, the, the Super Pack and the Super Disc. Uh, these are our two lead technologies that we're using for this market. Both of them are a cellulose matrix. And what we've done is immobilize different filter additives in the cellulose matrix. And it's the ratio of these filter additives that end up... Uh, resulting in a specific removal efficiency. So you may find that one grade doesn't work well for your product, have it be you need to go coarser or you need to go tighter. Having the availability to do that uh, and seamlessly integrate it all within the same housing has been really great. Focusing now on color removal, going off to the, the point of several different grades, there are a few different grades of, of carbon uh, specifically, what I like to highlight here is that it really depends on, on what you're trying to remove. So not only just color, but we have certain customers that are interested in eliminating off odors or off flavors from a distillate that may be going into an edible skew. So having the ability to really tailor what carbon you want to use to once again solve a specific problem. Uh, these carbon filters do come in a variety of sizes. We offer a 12-inch and a 16-inch, the 16-inch being about 2.7 times more surface area at your disposal. Um, keeping on that point, going back to the clarification, we do offer uh, several different sizes of these filters, the smaller being 0.4 metered squared, the largest being all the way up to 8 metered squared. And once again, having the capability of stacking these to increase the surface area as it's necessary. Now, looking at the photo uh, front and center here, you may be thinking that this was processed through a carbon filter, and that's actually not the case. Uh, this was ran through one of our sheets, and you can see uh, the types of particulate that we're, we're removing from this uh, fluid stream. So some really great results there. Maybe we can go to the next slide, please. Beautiful. So once again, I come from a chemistry background and it's great telling you how these filters work, but it, what I like to focus on really is the why. Uh, so if you were to focus down below at this evolution chain of our filters, uh, initially we started with our sites sheet filters, which eventually evolved into our first generation lenticular, our SD1, which has now evolved to our Super Disc 2. It, which has led us to the latest and greatest, uh, what I would define as the gold standard, our super pack module. Now, focusing first on the super pack module, if you were to zoom in on this photo, what you would see is very precise holes have been cut into the filter media. Essentially, what this has done in throughout this evolutionary process is, you know, a lot of diligence has been put on um, engineering the path of resistance through the filter, ensuring that we're maximizing the contact time. Um, the end result of that is increasing the filter efficiency. So the Super Pack utilizes our edge flow technology uh, once again, and that is the way that we accomplish that is by specifically engineering uh, the holes in this filter. Now, you may be asking the question, well, why would someone choose to use an SD2 style filter or the Super Pack? It's a great question. Um, for high solid applications, something like a CO2 process, or maybe you're doing an ambient temperature uh, ethanol process, or you left the extraction kettle too long, and now you're starting to pick up all this nasty, nasty particulate, you would want to use an SD2. And the, and the reason behind that is that it has a greater dirt holding capacity. So, 
it has the uh, the option for a filter cake to build uh, on the outside of the filter. Whereas the Super Pack, once again, it's really defined by that edge flow technology and those holes. Now, with that, if you were to put something like a 40% solid load uh, CO2 extract with the Super Pack, it can handle it well initially. But as those holes start to block, um, you'll start to find that you're starting to lose your flow over time to where it wouldn't be economical uh, for your manufacturing process. Once again, to summarize, uh, SD2 for more higher solid application super pack uh, for something like an ethanol uh, process. Excellent. Uh, one thing that I think is really valuable that we can offer is the ability for a lab scale proof of concept. Now, uh, you know, I would never want to speak with a customer and say, this is the filter that you should use. You should take our word for it, put in the PO, uh, and let's get the ball rolling. I think a, a lot better way of operating is actually utilizing what we call our super caps. Uh, so you can see these here. They are a small 22 centimeter squared filter that utilizes the same filter media that you'll see in our larger filters. Now, it, you can't use these to anticipate the throughputs that you can see. Rather, it's a proof of concept and it lets you understand the filtrate quality. Um, so really it can answer the question, do we need to go with a tighter filter or a looser filter? Uh, we do offer these in both uh, for the carbon applications as well as the just common sheets with no carbon. So some really great value we can add there. Uh, this is a process. Typically, I'll speak with a customer, guide them in how to use them. It's very simple. It uses a, a lure lock fitting. You can buy a syringe off of the Amazon for a couple dollars. I would suggest a 30 mil or a 50 mil uh, just to make your life a little bit easier. Or if you want to take a more... Uh, quantitative approach and eliminate some variables such as flow rate, you can use a peristaltic pump with a known flow rate. And that will give a bit more insight uh, into answering total throughputs. But once again, it's really just for understanding the product quality coming out of the filter. Now, those things this are handy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, we were with Klaus when we were first testing all of this, and he can speak a little bit to that process, but it was right. it was really fun. And then later when we moved our process up and, you know, you send a couple of these guys out, it was just easy to just kind of start narrowing down our, our options. So, and they're really easy to use. So. Absolutely. We actually, just as recently as a couple of months ago, I think it was, what was it, two months ago at this point, uh, we were out there and what we found was for a cryoethanol extraction, initially we were using what we would define as our super pack 7100 we found that although the filtrate quality was great coming out of it, since we were seeing such long throughputs through the filter, we had the ability to tighten it down to what we would call our 5,900. So 71 to 59, uh, we would define that as a, a tighter filter, the 5,900. So once again, more filter additive to help polishing uh, the extract. So going back to the theme of constant innovation, uh, continuing to push, push our knowledge in this industry and really see what works be best to solve uh, specific problems. Uh, next slide, please. Beautiful. So, uh, Klaus, if you want to speak a little bit about the, you know, the option of, of if you're using a filter and it turns out that you outgrow it, uh, the seamless integration of just a larger housing. I know this is something that Helderpad has been exploring recently. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to buy something that is able to grow with you. Um, rather than uh, having to box it up and uh, setting it on uh, one of your tall racks and never have to look at it again. It's nice um, to be able to just, um, you know, keep your, keep your protocols the same um, and, and just scale up. And uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of says it all, you know, we started out with a, with a small, um, actually they're, they're not even on here, but you know, these little, uh, <laughs> Smaller filters, of course, neatly enclosed, uh, all stainless steel, and you know we've we've now um, upgraded uh, a couple of times, and um, and it, it you know without having to change the protocols or doing anything like that. So again, it it, it makes sense to try to find something that um, that grows with you. Yep, absolutely. And one thing that I do want to mention here is a lot of people ask 
flow rates. Um, they've been stuck using either a, a sheet press or a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a Buchner funnel style filter. And, and just to give you guys some insight, if you look at to the, to, the le- uh, to the farthest right, the largest filter housing, we actually have customers in other industries um, that are filtering at several hundred gallons a minute. So from a flow rate perspective, it's really just getting the surface area sized properly to meet your expectations. Um, there really is a, I like to call it like the Goldilocks zone of filtration where you're not so small that you're having to switch your filters out in between the run, but you're not so large that you're having notable product loss. Product loss uh, coming from, you can imagine if it is a cellulose based filter, it does have a similar property to something like a paper towel. Uh, that can be mitigated quite easily if you do an ethanol push at the end of your run in a couple other different ways. Um, but yeah, some really great stuff there. Next slide, please. Going back to the theme, uh, customers talk, we listen. So being a part of the SLS organization, really the core function is solving customer problems. But before we can solve a problem, we need to understand what we're up against. So being able to work with customers with their specific fluids, uh, trialing different technologies like what we initially did with Klaus, seeing what works best and being able to back that up with data. So in this case, this was kind of uh, an interesting process. I thought it was interesting. Maybe some of you will think it was a run of the mill, but this was actually an oil extraction. So I I believe they're using an edible oil that was slightly heated. Um, And you can see the far left image, it it was quite nasty. So throwing several different types of filters at it, seeing what yielded the best results, specifically for uh, the customer's outline success criteria. This was a case I like to highlight. It was 200 liters of this oil was filtered in 45 minutes. And that's on the slower end of, of, of what is possible in terms of, uh, of flow rates. And also keeping in mind that this is a scalable solution, uh, knowing that the filters can grow as that customer uh, increases demand. Once again, unmatched customer to support. It's something that I find really valuable working with Paul Corporation. It's been a great opportunity for me being able to take my knowledge of, of food and beverage manufacturing, really implement that to solve customer problems. This isn't something we only do for the cannabis industry. We have a deep knowledge of wine, spirits, uh, really interesting new types of projects have been coming in the protein space. Um, so some of the core functions that we as SLS associates uh, serve, and this is a global organization, things like process monitoring optimization. We've talked a bit about enough about optimization, so I won't hammer that one in. What I do want to mention, though, are plant surveys. And these are always really uh, entertaining for me because we get to actually walk the manufacturing floor, understand uh, certain things that you may not even realize may be a problem. So how are you um, providing sterile air um, potentially for a bottling line, or are you using CO2? Is that CO2 sterile that you're using for a gas push at the end of a filter run? Um, So being able to find hidden value across the manufacturing floor, problems that you may not have had to address uh, previously, um, but it's always valuable. Now, uh, we mentioned in the bio earlier, I have a passion for education, and this is always a great opportunity to work with our customers and coach and guide them as to the best practices as to how to use our filter. Um, If I could summarize everything that I've said so far is that our filters should create a solution, not create a problem. Um, So making sure that the end users are properly using our filters to solve the problem at hand. Uh, One other thing, potentially you're thinking of getting into the beverage market. Uh, How are you going to confirm stabilization if you can't use a, uh, a pasteurization type process? So knowing that we do have different membrane technologies that can be leveraged uh, to confirm shelf stability without degrading any of the valuable cannabinoids that you may be using uh, in that skew. Next slide, please. Thank you. Quality assured, quality delivered, um, being able to provide a consistent product so you can uh, essentially standardize as much as you can the process at hand being able to provide declarations of compliance, working with our customers to understand what they need from a regulatory standpoint and being able to work with them 
uh, to make sure that, you know, every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Perfect. Quality compliance for Paul customers. Obviously, as this industry has been uh, aging over the last several years, and I'm happy to see this because there's been a huge push for documentation in terms of uh, what's going into their manufacturing process. So we've put a, a major precedence at Paul Corporation, working very closely with our regulatory and our legal team to be able to provide a comprehensive documentation package. If you find that these doc this documentation package isn't sufficient, we would love to get on the phone with you, understand uh, what you need and the whys and hows behind why you need that regulation. Uh, as you guys know, it's a very dynamic point. Um, every state is different. Different countries have different things that they require. Um, so once again, being able to work with the customer to make sure that we're providing a, a best solution that you can confidently use. Next slide, please. Perfect. Now, uh, these are several questions. Uh, what I wanted to do is uh, for anyone that may have a manufacturing facility or if you're entertaining to start one, these are just a couple of considerations to take into mind. So if you wouldn't mind going to the, the first one. Beautiful. So what is your current filter spend in dollars a gallon? So, you know, this is something just to give a ballpark of what your current filter spend is as you look towards different types of solutions so you can make a direct comparison. Keep in mind, uh, time is a very important piece to this puzzle. Um, if you're having to refilter, do several different passes, ultimately increasing something that could be done in 15 minutes to over a day. Uh, next point, please. What are your anticipated daily throughputs in gallons? Once again, going back to the Goldilocks zone, it's really important that we understand what you're anticipating on a daily basis to make sure that there's no waste being generated in your filtration process. How long does your current filtration process take for one gallon? This is really just a rough metric, once again, that we'll use uh, to kind of uh, understand our technologies versus whatever you've currently been using. The other point I like to make is that do you require several passes? I, I think we can all agree that the industry has evolved far enough uh, from a technology perspective that you really shouldn't require several passes unless you have a good reason for it. Um, I, I sure hope not. Uh, if you guys do currently do several passes, please uh, reach out. Let's get on a call together and talk about how we can move towards a single pass solution. How are you confirming shelf stability? We talked about this earlier, so I won't hammer on this one. Um, it may not even be a consideration at this point. Um, but if someone was to ask you this, how would you answer it? Uh, and would you have a path forward to getting that question answered efficiently? Uh, are there any steps in your upstream process that may result in a lower than expected throughput? This is a really valuable question and it really comes back to the process consulting. So uh, are you using something that's exerting shearing forces, uh, something like a screw press, right? Now you're gonna have more actual particulate if you don't have a centrifuge to capture those. Um, what are your extraction parameters? You know, are, are what temperature is your ethanol at? If you do it warmer, obviously you're going to be pulling up more adulterants to uh, the fluid stream. So just considerations as you move forward and how all of this may impact not just filtration, but the, the rest of the uh, complete process. And I'll leave you with this. A filter is a filter. Right. So, Klaus, if you wouldn't mind chiming in here, giving us your thoughts on this one. Um, yeah, no, yeah, filters a filter. I mean, you know, uh, providing that all the specs and all that are meeting there, it's uh, it clears something up. It keeps something behind. That's what a filter mm -hmm. does. But you clearly out of this story, I take away anyway, is that, you know, it's it's about what filter you're actually using. Uh, mm -hmm. Or for what purpose and uh, getting really clear on that the filter can actually be a, a great help in in your process absolutely and last but not least we want to work with you hopefully you've been able to pull that from this presentation i really enjoy getting on the phone with customers speaking through your process and being able to place uh, a solution to solve that problem 
Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for presenting that amazing information pack session. Uh, we've got plenty of times for questions and answers, and we've already got a few on the board. So uh, thank you to all the audience members, specifically David, Vandana, and Connor, who have submitted questions um, so far. Uh, please do join them. We want the next uh, 15 minutes to be as engaging uh, for all of you all, as well as our panelists as possible. Um, so feel free to hop over to the Q&A board. You'll find that button along the bottom toolbar within the Zoom platform. And then even if you don't have a question to contribute yourself, do review the ones that we've already got submitted and give ones an upvote if you think that they're particularly worthwhile and will help us drive the conversation where you want it to go. All right. Beautiful. So with that, why don't we dive right into one of these questions here? And I'm obviously not a technical expert here. So if uh, my rewording of these questions is a little bit off. I do apologize in advance, but let's do chronological right now. So uh, David Dixon submitted a question uh, earlier on in the webinar. Um, so David said, I had heard a vendor claim that with negative 60 degrees to negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that the fats and waxes remained in the biomass and did not carry into the crude oil extracted. Did I understand that cream claim correctly? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Absolutely. You don't have, you don't have to go as cold, um, but yeah, the colder you're going, the, the more at least fats and waxes you leave behind. Um, chlorophyll uh, also will, will stay behind, but it will also come through. And that kind of depends a little bit more on how aggressive the wash is that you're doing with that, with that uh, alcohol or that solvent. Absolutely. I, I would say if you have the capability of doing a cryo extraction process uh, for ethanol every day of the week, I would suggest that I think from just a, an overall process standpoint, uh, if you're capable of getting down to those temperatures, it alleviates so many pain points across the process. Not all of them, but it definitely right. alleviates them. And there's a little bit of a, a mixed bag here too, or at least there's a calculation to be made where you can say, hey, you know what, it, it, it costs every time you go you know, 10 degrees colder, it costs quite a bit more and the, and the cooling equipment becomes more and your electricity bills become more. And so we actually found we, we operate mostly at minus 40. Um, and, and so somewhere between minus 20 and minus 40 is our sweet spot. And that with a super pack filter uh, put in place, we actually have, you know, very clean material and, um, and have no problems in our further down the road uh, distillation processes. So, you know, there, there is something to say there that, you know, yes, it is really nice to buy, you know, equipment and, and get minus 80 going, but there's a there's a cost there and there's a probably a cost benefit analysis that should be taken. Um, you know, it, it's probably easier. I don't know, you know, just, uh, just, Put that in mind. You don't have to go to coal. It becomes quite expensive. Um, and so, you know, there's that trade-off that you need to look at. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. Great. Great response to that question. So let's dive into another one here. We've got a question from Jack Jacobs. Um, he asks, can you talk a little bit more about how this is an improvement from the Buckner funnels? Um, absorption first particle only retention specifically? And mm. Absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, that should have been covered in the presentation there. I must have slipped. So once again, going back to the different types of filters that we're using in using a comparison of a coffee filter, uh, a coffee filter, obviously not having any filter additive, you know, diathematious earth, perlate, things of that nature. What's actually happening is it's really interesting. So it's the weak intermolecular forces between the filter additives and the amorphous waxes uh, that are allowing for a really great bright product uh, to be resulting. So if you're thinking, if you're working with a, 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 uh, an actual particulate, something like uh, a piece of biomass that may have made it through, um, a coffee filter will do fine with that. But when you start working into these strange amorphous type solids, that's really where you want the benefit of the intermolecular forces of the filter additives. Hopefully that answered your question. Perfect. If that didn't answer your question, just let us know, Jack, and we'll make sure to um, provide a more explanatory response to that either here in the uh, webinar broadcast or within the Slack channel, which will remain open for the next 48 hours. 
All right, perfect. And Jack says that's good. All right, perfect. We've got another question uh, from Connor O'Hara. Um, and I'm not sure if this means winterization inside of this uh, question or not. So does, okay, perfect. So polypropylene gets pretty b- brittle at low temperatures, like during winterization. Um, any mm-hmm. problems that you foresee with these filters uh, for that process? This is a fantastic question. Um, it, regarding the polypropylene, there's a glass point that you'll see, I believe it's around negative 20. So you're actually going to be pushing it if you're at negative 40 below the glass point. Now, w- what's important to note here is that the integrity of the filter. So we have customers that are using these and we haven't found any issues, um, but there really isn't a hammering effect. So even when you're using something like a diaphragm pump, uh, that push and pull force we haven't found is enough to actually uh, infringe on the integrity, the the mechanical integrity of the filter. Uh, so great question, but to everything that we've seen so far, uh, no, they, they really do work well. Granted, if you were to open up your housing, pick it up and throw it on the ground, I'm sure you would have some problems, but uh, hopefully there's no forces like that inside your filtration process. And so you should be fine. Not a problem there. Perfect. Klaus, Cla- do you have any, any points to that? I know that you guys initially no, were I, using. I have no, I've not seen any problems with it. Um, and we have tried colder, uh, colder methods too. Um, so no, I've, I've, I've not seen it. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, we've got two more questions here since we've already um, addressed one from David. Why don't I go to Vandana next? So uh, Vandana asks, is there a system to remove the Maillard reaction products similar to molasses in a hydro space? I'm I'm Googling uh, Maillard (laughs) right right now. I'm trying to understand a little bit more as to what this would be. So. Probably shouldn't be doing this live. Uh, any <laughs> idea what that one is, Klaus? No. <laughs> Let's see. Well, okay, so it looks like exact- sugars. Uh, chemical reaction between amino acids and reducing sugar. So is another way of asking this question, how are we solving uh, the problem of sugars if not doing a, uh, a water wash? Ah, okay, great. So I, I think this would be Both pertaining... Yeah, I think this would be pertaining to moreover on like the distillation step when you're having those carbonized, uh, nasty things. So once again, uh, what we found is that by by integrating the, the, the solution for not only clarification, but also integrating the activated carbon, um, I don't have formal data in terms of a sugar reduction, um, but Klaus can attest and, and many other customers as well after implementing that you can visibly or, or qualitatively see less of this present. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I love the back and forth and love being uh, being put on the spot and finding a, a good answer to that right there. So just perfect. Um, great. So we've got one more final question from David. Um, just a heads up to the audience members that we do still have a few minutes um, left in our official one hour that we have allotted for this session. So don't uh, miss this opportunity to get your questions answered live by our panel of experts today. So David Dixon's final question is, can you select extraction and filtration equipment mm. to avoid needing a C1D1 room and allow a C1D2 room? No plate and frames. Class, I'll leave this one to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and it, it is a tricky one um, because a lot of um, jurisdictions will use, will have, uh, or use some leeway and or are not you know it kind of depends on your fire marshal um in some cases um making sure that you have a complete closed loop system is probably your best bet in this um and then making sure that you have proper engineering um drawings and paperwork uh, along with that um and from what I understand and what I've gotten from Paul is, is that at least from that filter part, they have that. You, you don't always see it in a lot of the other equipment, but if you buy proper equipment, um, each each one should have um, the engineering drawings with it. And then um, and then it is up to you to, to find an engineering uh, team that will put the whole thing together and, and supply the proper paperwork. But I think, you know, 
staying close loop, um, being aware of uh, where the ins and outs, where material um, um, comes out of the system um, is is kind of the way to go at it. I know that's uh, you know it's it's a tricky one. We see it every day, um, and and different jurisdictions uh, are are harder or more difficult to work with than others. Um, cool. Yeah, it's a new industry for a lot of um, a lot of fire marshals, and and so they're looking at it with very suspicious eyes. Yeah, very, very good point. Very good point. Always be, always be aware of your local regulations. Mm-hmm. Um, perfect. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of the hour, um, and it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions submitted to the Q and A board. Um, so we're going to start to wind things down here. Um, before we start to conclude things, I do want to turn it back over to Connor and Klaus if they have a final thought and a key takeaway um, that all the audience members um, can take away from today's session. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll summarize with this. Just uh, as you move forward, remember, filtration should, should solve a problem. It shouldn't create one. Uh, I think that's really the, the biggest takeaway that I can offer. Uh, also, something that you may find val- valuable is if you go to uh, paul.com food and beverage slash cannabis, we are offering 30-minute consultations uh, for free. There's no charge to this. Um, and so reach out if you would like to have a conversation or a discussion, and I'll leave you with that. Klaus? Yeah, same here. Um, we're at the Helderpad. Always happy to uh, talk through your um, through your options, what you're looking for, help you find the right solution, help you um, upgrade your processes, and um, make sure you have a you know an efficient process. Mm-hmm. Fantastic distillation systems there. It's uh, always mm-hmm. nice when I'm at a customer and I and I see one. Oh, hey, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you both Connor and Klaus for joining us this afternoon and and working with our team over the last two months to develop this session and present it to our network of members and supporters. Uh, We couldn't be more appreciative of all the efforts that you all have um, worked with us on doing so. So um, as always, we want to conclude our uh, Industry Essentials webinar by giving you a quick preview of some upcoming activities that you can partake in within the NCIA uh, network of opportunities. Um, So in case all of you all missed it, um, our Cannabis Business Cyber Summit was held, uh, the live days were held across last week. We had three days, had over 2,000 people um, joining us for a fantastic virtual conference. Um, As all you all can see here, um, the event is now on demand for the next 30 days. So NCIA members are granted complimentary access um, to the 30 plus hours of content.